So, the plan today is to give you a gentle introduction to the issues that arise when uh, you allow information exchange between agents. Okay. So, in this case this particular uh, the first topic that I will uh, talk to you about is what are called what is concerns itself with the problem of free play communication. Okay. So, players uh, are communicating uh, are allowed in this case to communicate with each other before the game before actually uh, taking a decision and the question that is asked in this paper is whether this this actually leads them to play a particular Nash equilibrium. Okay. So, this is a classic paper by Robert Oman. Uh, the title of the paper is Nash equilibria are not self enforcing. Now, what we will do today is we will do a reading of this paper because it is a very easy paper to read it is almost just like a little story that he has written. I uh, and uh, through that we will actually learn some uh, some lessons about pre play communication. So, one of the things that one of the justifications that is used uh, for the Nash equilibrium is that it is said to be self enforcing. Self enforcing means what that uh, it means that if a pre play agreement has been reached that play for in which players have agreed to play a particular Nash equilibrium to play a Nash equilibrium then that Nash equilibrium will be played during game play as well. Okay. So, which means that the agreement to play a Nash equilibrium actually enforces the Nash equilibrium itself. Okay. So, this is what the, the this concept is known this property is known as self enforcing and it is one of the intuitive justifications for the Nash equilibrium. As you as you have seen Nash equilibria are not we cannot derive the concept of a Nash equilibrium we can just define it and then say well justify it. Yes. So, uh, so all those calculations are anyway part of the definition of the Nash equilibrium. The Nash equilibrium is defined by saying that well it is a point from which no player would want to deviate because no uh, and uni, uh, no player would want to unilaterally deviate and because only unilateral deviations are allowed. So, that is if anything is not a Nash equilibrium then there is a problem. So, here the question is Ah, uh, yeah, that's a that's a different thing. That is that's the problem of learning a Nash equilibrium, or arriving at a Nash equilibrium. You know, through some kind of a dynamical process. There, there are various types of results. I mean, convexity based, and uh, I mean, usually this leads to a dynamical systems analysis of the. Uh, so the Na around the Na the Nash equilibrium has to be an attractor. Okay, eventually your adjustment process should come get you back to the get you to the Nash equilibrium. So, you need a kind of a stability study uh, a dynamical system stability study for this. But here the question is not how, whether a Nash equilibrium is meaningful. Okay, the Nash equilibrium is meaningful uh, by itself, but one of the justifications for giving uh, for why we uh, you know why we uh, say the Nash equilibrium is uh, is uh, is meaningful is that we say that it enforces these self enforcing agreements okay so so let's just read through what uh, what he's written the the intuitive basis for nash's uh, concept of strategic equilibrium in non cooperative games has recently received considerable attention a rationale that has been suggested is that nash equilibria represents self enforcing agreements that a pre play agreement to play a certain strategy tuple will be kept if and only if it is a nash equilibrium Several years ago, we came across an example that throws doubt on this contention. The example has been cited in various contexts, but has not, but uh, not heretofore been discussed on its own merits. So, he is going to discuss this example. Okay. All right. So, the example here is uh, so the the game of figure one has two pure strategy Nash equilibria C C and D D. Okay. Let's just see what the uh, Nash equilibrium the figure is. So, these are two two player game completely symmetric okay player 1 on the uh, plays rows player 2 plays columns 
C and D are the are the pure strategies. And this is an econ paper, so this is players are maximizing. Okay, so both players are looking for the maximum payoff. Now, in this case, if you see this matrix, the there are two Nash equilibria. Okay, the Nash equilibria are C C and D D. Okay, so let's just study this carefully. So, if you see C C has is this nine comma nine. Okay, that's that's obviously a Nash equilibrium here. You can compare nine with eight here and nine with eight here. All right, so that's a that's a Nash equilibrium. D D is seven comma seven. Okay, so okay, playing uh, D this is also a Nash equilibrium because seven, playing seven is better than zero and seven is better than zero here. All right. Now you can see that C C is it has some now out of these two equilibria, both have some justification in addition to them being Nash equilibrium. Okay, or both have some additional property. So here C C is what is called Pareto dominant. Pareto dominant means it is better than for all players to play C C than it is to play any other Nash equilibrium. Okay, so each player benefits by by playing C C. Okay, it's a Nash equilibrium and it's uniformly better than all other Nash equilibrium. So this is one of the justifications that is used to eliminate an equilibrium like D D, for example. So say well, well, C C is better for everyone. So since uh, since you are selecting one Nash equilibrium, may as well select C C. But D D has another property. D D is is what is called risk risk dominant. So I have not taught you this concept, but roughly speaking, the idea is each player tries to think of what would happen if the other player deviates from the Nash equilibrium. Okay, if the other player deviates, what's the what's the loss that I can incur? Now, in this case, what's happening is you look at D D. If the other player deviates, right, then suddenly what happens is you you end up getting uh, uh, the, any player. So, if suppose take the row player, okay, is playing D, but the column player doesn't stick to D, but deviates to. Um, okay, actually, this is I'm being a little bit imprecise here. So. So the, there is a notion by which you can, uh, by which you arrive at this by saying that uh, essentially you ask, okay, how how risky is it to play this? Means that suppose you have a certain projection about how the others play, and if you go wrong in that projection, okay, how how much of a risk are you taking? In this? And it turns out that in this case, D D is actually the one the equilibrium that has less risk as compared to the C C equilibrium. The reason C C has more risk than D D is is the following. So if if the row player is playing C and the column player is playing C, but suppose the column player doesn't play C and shifts to D, then the row player suddenly goes from nine to zero, right? So the risk there is much higher as compared to D D, where the risk is just one, right? If the if they are playing D D and the other player shifts from D to C. Then you would then then you would lose not not one sorry the risk is seven is this clear so so, so for example here if if the um, okay actually it's minus one so in fact this is even safer then right so the point is C C is somehow is is risky in the sense that it is a, if you have gone wrong in some cal project you know there's a model behind all this okay this the, that helps you eliminate equilibria and cc is more risky because if up it uh, the idea is that if the other player does not stick to c and instead shifts to something else then the loss incurred is much higher is much higher than the one in d all right okay so dd is therefore what is called risk dominant it is safer in some sense okay now now indeed since players cannot communicate the row player Alice may may well be uncertain that the column player Bob will play C. All right. So the, since players cannot communicate, there is no guarantee that they would in fact both coordinate on C. They could uh, they could as as well coordinate on D. Right. She might therefore wish to play D, which assures her seven. Whereas with C, she may get nothing. Moreover, if she takes into account that Bob may reason the same way, she is all the more likely to play D. This makes it still more likely that Bob too will play D and so on. All right, this is effectively the reasoning that leads you to D D being the safer equilibrium. All right, we do not, however, assert that reasonable players must play D 
only that they may do so and that D is not unreasonable or foolish. Okay. And for the time being, we assert this only when there is no preplay communication. Right. Is this clear? So, in, in the absence of preplay communication, both equilibria, there are two equilibria of this game and both equilibria have something attractive. CC is, is Pareto dominant, DD is safer. Right. So, and the, the, the safer reasoning is basically just this that is that is given here. Okay. All right. Now, let us now change the scenario by permitting preplay communication and this is where things get interesting. On the face of it, it seems that the players can then agree to play CC. So, if you allow players to communicate in this game, all right. So, suppose now you this is the game they are faced with and now players are allowed to discuss what they are going to play. So, what would they agree to do? They would agree to play CC because after all it is better for everyone, right? So, they would agree to play CC. On the face of it, it seems that players can then agree to play CC. Though the agreement is not enforceable, it removes each player's doubt about the other players playing, other player playing C, okay? Now, but the question is, does it indeed remove this doubt? Suppose that Alice is a careful, prudent person and in the absence of an agreement would play D, okay? So, suppose the Alice is, is in the absence of an agreement would play D. Suppose now that players agree on CC and each player retires to his corner in order to actually make a choice. So, they have verbally agreed to each other that they are going to play C and now comes the question of, okay, actually making the choice, all right? So, you have an assurance that from the other one, a verbal assurance that I am going to, that the other player saying that he is going to play C. The question is, does he, what, what, what information does that give you, okay, okay. So, Alice is about to choose C when she says to herself, wait, I have a few minutes, let me think this over. Suppose that Bob does not trust me and so will play D in spite of our agreement then he would still want me to play C because that way he will get 8 rather than 7. And of course, also if he does play C, it is better for him that I play C. Thus, he wants me to play C no matter what. So, he wants me, he wants the agreement to play C, C, C in any case. It does not bind him and it might increase the chances of my playing C. That does not imply that he will necessarily play D but he may. Since he wants the agreement no matter what he plays, the agreement conveys no information about his play. In fact, he may as well have signed it without giving any thought as to how to actually play. Since he can reason about the same way about me, neither of us gets any information from the agreement. It is as if there were no agreement. So, I will now choose what I should have, I would have chosen without an agreement, namely D. It is, it is. So, that is that's basically the point. The question is what, so if you have agreed previously to do something and it is that agreement is on some, on a point that is mutually beneficial, okay, beneficial, uniformly beneficial as compared to the other point, does it mean that that will actually get played? So, the question is when Bob says that let us, let us do this, let us both play C, what does that, what that is a form of, of that is a message that he is sending. He is not actually binding himself, but he is saying, he is conveying the intent, let us play C, all right. Now, from that, from, from that communication, what can Alice infer? So, this is not a question of psychology or any of that. This is a question of what information content is present in the, in the signal to say, to play C. And that is basically the point. Now, why is there no new information? So, if that is the case, if there is no new information, then you know any sort of preplay communication would typically carry no new information. There is something special about this, this matrix here. So, 
so that that's that's essentially the thing here so when when bob says that i let us play c there are two things you two ways you can two pieces of information you could potentially get from this one is that bob wants to play c the other is that bob wants alice to play c now you look at this cost function there is actually something very nice about this so bob is the column player right and alice is uh, alice is the row player is there anything dominating uh, here any strategy dominates anything here nothing dominates anything right see 9 is greater than 8 but 0 is less than 7 okay? likewise for the column so there's no dominant strategy here no there's no dominance but here, there is a kind of a reverse type of dominance happening here in the in the following sense so if you look at what bob is going to get as a function of what alice plays okay now Alice playing C, if Alice plays C, Bob gets 9 and 8 and if Alice plays D, Bob gets 0 and 7. So Alice playing C is better for Bob than Alice playing D. So through this communication, pre-play communication, what Bob, what Alice is saying is that what Bob has signaled is not that he wants to play C, he may or may not want to play C, it's that he wants Alice to play C. Not necessarily. I mean, <laughs> see, that's the point. So this, this, this is so the so so the point is from here from the signal that let's sign this agreement. Okay, it is not conclusive that Bob wants to actually play what is said in that agreement. Okay, when Bob says uh, not let's sign this agreement, what did I say? When Bob says let's play CC. It is from there you Alice cannot conclude that Bob means to say that I will play C. It could also mean something else. In this case, it means that uh, it means that Bob wants Alice to play C. Is this clear? So this is basically the issue. That so when you allow for communication like this. Right, the communication uh, from the communication, what you are trying, what you are inferring is some sort of hidden state that is available, that is there at both players end. So in this case, the hidden state is, say, let's say, which which of these two equilibrium strategies would the player want to want to play? So we have reduced the player game now down, down to these two equilibria. Now the question is between these two equilibria, right? So it's a question of estimating which one, what is it that you would is your preference. Whereas now in this case, what we have seen, what we are seeing is that the intent to sign to play CC doesn't actually mean does not actually convey the intent to play C from on Bob's part. It just it it just says that he's well. Let's play CC because that is exactly that you you playing C is better for me, and then. Of course, there is nothing special about Alice. Alice. Bob could reason the same way and then effectively both both would go back and, and do what they would do without an agreement. Now, this is not saying that players should, cannot, will not play C. Okay? This does not play, say that players cannot play CC. It just says that the agreement to play CC does not imply necessarily force them to play C that implication does not hold okay also the way it's written here it you may feel like well oh this is sort of trying to justify that one should always play d that is not what is being said either so for example it just says that what the players would play what they would play in the absence of an agreement so the agreement is non informative is this clear okay so of course it so here here's you can read through this of course it may be that alice is not careful and prudent but impulsive and optimistic and likes to think that bob is also is so she may then choose c even without an agreement and 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 so also with one we are not saying that rational players will never play c but only that agreeing to do so won't lead them to do it okay a player might play c or d whether or not he has agreed to CC, the agreement has no effect one way or the other. In such circumstances, the agreement should not be called self-enforcing. Okay, so 
the po so this is basically his main point that you can uh, the pre play communication is may not actually lead you to a uh, pre play communication to play up uh, and an agreement to play a particular equilibrium may not imply that you are in uh, that you will in fact play that equilibrium okay so let's take another example so this is the uh, this is the battle of sexes game this is a coordination game you can see here so uh, the this is the, uh, the above reasoning is not universal an agreement to play an equilibrium often is self enforcing okay. consider for example the familiar battle of sexes so this is figure 2 here so the this uh, this this game has has two players uh, uh, husband and a wife they want to both decide on whether they want to go to a ballet or to watch uh, you know a fight or some see some boxing match or something but they would both want to do whatever it is they would want to do it together rather than do separate things so they get no payoff if they don't coordinate so if one guy goes to the ballet and the other goes to the fight they get both they, they both get zero if they both go to the ballet then the row player gets two and column player gets one if they both go to the fight then the row player gets one column player gets two okay this is the battle of sexes so essentially the players want to coordinate on one of these two either ff or bb so and both of these ff and bb are both nash equilibria here okay so now the you can see here this is a sort of classic case where some some bit of communication would help pre play communication would help because if you can signal your intent to say okay this is where this is where i would want to go then the other player would also want to coordinate on on that right but you have to be careful because not every time does not that intent is doesn't actually uh, is not uh, informative but in this in this particular case you see the numbers are such that in fact it is informative okay so consider for example the familiar battle of sexes without pre play communications communication the players will be hard put to choose between ballet and fight but if they agree to bb then they are motivated to keep the agreement to explain to explain why consider again how alice might reason it is not that she takes the agreement as a direct signal that bob will keep it rather like in the previous section she realizes that by signing the agreement bob is signaling that he wants her to keep it okay but unlike in the previous section here the fact that he wants her to keep it implies that he intends to keep it him, himself okay so for her too it is worthwhile to keep it similarly for him this agreement is self enforcing okay so if you want to see why this is the case why uh, uh, why he when the fact that he wants her to keep it implies that he intends to keep it himself if broad plays b then he would prefer, prefer her to play b if he plays f he would prefer her to play f and that's because of the coordination structure of this game so if he is playing b he would prefer that she she also uh, plays b because uh, because because in fact uh, otherwise he is going to get zero it's not like he prefers ballet or prefers fight irrespective of what uh, sorry he prefers her to play ballet irrespective of what he wants her to do, wants to do himself so if you see here look at bob's payoffs 1 and 0 one zero is not does not uh, one zero is what he gets if alice goes to the ballet if alice goes to the fight one zero which doesn't dominate zero two right so he would want alice to go to the ballet only if he himself also wants to go to the ballet all right okay so this is this is an example a very a very uh, very nice example of uh, uh, of what what happens uh, of the you know once we start allowing communication within games okay so now let's uh, uh, we can this this whole problem of communication within games is actually uh, interesting in its own in its own right so uh, let's just read the last bit of discussion uh, and then we can move because here there are there's a key there are a few key points that uh, that he makes here to say that uh, that a game is non cooperative means that there is no external mechanism available for enforcing agreements thus when that when time comes to choose an action the players are assumed to act on the basis of existing incentives therefore an agreement is effective 
only if it changes the incentives that obtain in the presence of the agreement. Okay. Incentives can be changed in two ways. Either the payoffs are changed or the information. Okay. Either the payoffs are changed or the information of the players. Agreements being discussed here do not change the payoff. The payoffs for any particular strategy tuple remain the same whether or not it violates the agreement. Okay, so, the agreement in that sense is not a binding agreement or there is no law or no other framework available to punish you in case you break the agreement. So, the payoff does not actually change even if you violate the agreement. So, therefore, to be effective an agreement must change the player's information, okay. specifically their information about how others will play. An information about an event E is acquired by observing a parameter that depends on whether or not E obtains. If the parameter does not really depend on E, that is it has the same value whether or not E obtains, then observing it yields no information about E. Okay. In the games of figure uh, figure 1 and 3, this uh, I skipped figure, uh, the other example 3, Alice is interested in knowing what Bob will play. We may take E to be the event Bob will play C. The parameter she observes is whether or not he agrees to CC, okay. But this parameter is the same no matter what Bob, what Bob plays. It is always to his advantage to agree to CC, okay. Therefore, the agreement yields no information about what he will really play. Since the agreement is important only for the information it yields and yields no information, it is as if it had not been made. Is this clear? Okay. So, uh, there are also some nice, uh, nice uh, scenarios here, maybe we should go through that also. So, the game of figure 1 is sometimes called the stag hunt game actually, or the, the deer rabbit game. Okay. Two men agree to hunt a stag, to succeed they must go along separate paths giving their task undivided attention. On the way each has the opportunity to abandon the stag hunt and, and hunt rabbits instead. Okay. If he does so, the number of rabbits he bags increases if the other continues to hunt the stag. Both would prefer if it both hunted the stag, since it is more valuable than a bag of rabbits. But each fears that each mistrusts the other and that mistrust breeds more mistrust and so on. Okay. See, in the international relations literature, the game has been called a security dilemma. Two countries between which there is, there are uh, there is tension are each considering the deployment of a new expensive weapons system. Each of each is bet, uh, best off if neither has the system, but would be at a serious disadvantage if only the other had it. Can either side afford to not develop the system? Okay, so I, this is uh, some closely related game. Okay, this is okay non-transferable utilities and all that we don't. Need. Okay. So, this is this is again that sort of case. So, there are two equal uh, two equilibria. One is an equilibrium where, where uh, neither neither has you know this nuclear weapon, the other is when both have the nuclear weapon, neither is a better thing for both because it is it is very expensive to build have it. But on the other hand uh, the uh, it is sort of safer risk wise. The other equilibrium which in which both have uh, the nuclear weapon is is risk wise safer right. So, again can uh, can can either side afford to not develop the system and this is effectively what we see right. Okay. A non-binding agreement can affect the outcome of a game only if it conveys information about what other what the players will do. Directly the information that such an agreement conveys is not that the players will keep it since it is not binding, but that each player wants the other to keep it. I mean, we'll have to formally write it out. I mean, there is a there's there's some uh, he cited this Jar Jarvis paper. Now we'll have to look at exactly that. So there's a particular paper, security dilemma formulation. So a non-binding agreement can have the effect of uh, uh, can affect the outcome of the game only if it conveys information ab about what the other players will do. S directly, the information that such an agreement conveys is not that the players will keep it. Okay, because it's not a binding agreement but that each wants the other to keep it. In the battle of sexes, an agreement to play B, B says, B, B say conveys the information that each player prefers the other to play B. This implies that each play, each will play B himself, himself and so the agreement is self-enforcing. 
but in the game of figures 1 and 3, each player always prefers the other to play C no matter what he himself plays. Therefore, an agreement to play CC conveys no information about what the, what the players will do and cannot be considered self-enforcing. So, actually if you, if you uh, ever get a chance to be involved in some, uh, some of these decision uh, situations in which uh, let us say you want to collectively elect someone. Okay. But if you want, if that, for that person to be collectively elected, uh, let us say a common situation which is arising, you know, in, uh, in, in a lot of places is, um, is, uh, is that there are, there are like in, 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 in the city outside in Mumbai and in other cities also you will see this, that there are old buildings that are being torn down and redeveloped into, large, into newer buildings. Okay. And now the, but the, for you, for that proposal to uh, go through, a certain number of people from the existing building have to agree, have to vote in favor of it. All right. Now there could usually be competing proposals. Some that are better for some, some that are better for the others, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then there will always be situations where player people will want to convince the other to say, you know, to uh, no, no, you, you, you sign your part of this. And so on. You can see the risk. Uh, there is that. This is these. These are high stakes games because you are giving up your house effectively, and there will be situations where a player would want to convince the other player to sign a particular agreement, and you would always ask yourself, what is the meaning of that? Of you know, why did he come and talk to me? Right? What is he actually trying to say? Is it that he wants me to keep it? Or is it be, uh, or is it better for him that I keep it, or is he telling me that he plans to keep it? So these are all very closely related things, and they are all closely intertwined. You know, sometimes it could uh, there there is uh, there is another angle also here of uh, in which a player may commit first, okay, but the commitment has to be enforceable as well. It, the commitment you there's a there's a fine line between just me me coming and telling you I'm going to play C and me committing to play C. When I commit, I mean, have I really? It means that I have in fact uh, I have in fact you know that commitment can be enforced. It's not just me you know sort of just just verbally telling you that I plan to play C. Is this clear? So, so this is, uh, so th these are all the kind of issues that start showing up once we allow for communication between, uh, between players, okay. So, what is actually the information content in a, in a particular communication and so on is, is eventually that influences the decision, all right. So, what I want to do for the remaining part of the course is actually look at a few structured models that we know, in which we know of, uh, you know, the role of, uh, the uh, in which we know a little bit about the role of communication okay